Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the fourth episode of Building Accurate Habitats in Jurassic World Evolution 2. Here, we will focus on the first herbivore of the series, the Amargosaurus. Although not as famous as some sauropods like the Brachiosaurus, the distinctive appearance of Amargosaurus has made it a firm favorite amongst many who are interested in dinosaurs. We'll be learning a little bit about this unique dwarf short necked sauropod and then attempt to recreate its environment in enclosure. So let's jump right in and start getting to know the South American herbivore. For those who would like to skip ahead to the habitat recreation attempt, I provided some timestamps for you to click. For everyone else, let's begin. Amargosaurus was about 30 feet in length and weighed just under 4 tons, which was pretty small for a sauropod, but enormous for modern day standards. If it lived during the present day time, it would rank as the biggest land animal on earth. This peculiar sauropod lived in present day Argentina during the Cretaceous period about 120 to 129 million years ago. It belonged to a strange family of small sauropods called Dicosauridae, of which it is one of only four species currently discovered. The Amargosaurus unique claim to fame are its double row long spines sticking up from its shoulders and back. Were they for defense or for display? Paleontologists are still arguing on that mystery. Some early theories suggest that the spikes might have been covered by a thin flap of skin to form a sail that might have been used as a thermoregulatory structure using its sail to absorb and release the heat. But more recent theories suggest that they were simply spines, not attached to any sail and simply used for mating and or fending off predators. At the time of the discovery, the Amargosaurus was the only sauropod known to have possessed such imposing features. Years later, the Titanosaurus of the Cretaceous, direct descendants of the sauropods, were covered in scutes and spiny knobs, but these were nowhere near as ornate as those in Amargosaurus. Due to the position of the spines on its back, a Morgosaurus would have held its head fairly low to the ground most of the time, likely at a comfortable feeding height for fairly low growing plants. Unfortunately, the knowledge of a Morgosaurus is limited by the fact that only one single specimen of this dinosaur is known. What paleontologists do know is that since it was a sauropod, it most likely had a lifespan that might have been on the order of 100 years. Additionally, a big myth in the paleontological community thought that sauropods and stegosaurids had a second brain. Now they realized that what they thought was a second brain was an enlargement in the spinal cord in the hip area to score glycogen. The function of the storing of the glycogen is currently unknown, but the nerve center actually controlled the animal's hind legs and tail, and was larger than the Amargosaurus' tiny brain. This probably allowed the Amargosaurus to use its whip-like tail tip as a weapon against predators, much like other sauropods. And like many other sauropods, the Amargosaurus was thought to have traveled in herds and migrated when their local food supply diminished. Future expeditions hope to uncover further Amargosaurus fossils so that paleontologists can learn more about this creature. In the meantime, scientists hope to uncover more clues as they study the fossil they do have. The Amargosaurus fossil was unearthed by Guillermo Ruggier during a fossil expedition led by paleontologist José F. Bonaparte in 1984, a discovery that says it 40 years old. The same expedition was responsible for the discovery of Carnotaurus, a short-armed carnivorous dinosaur that lived about 50 million years after Amargosaurus. As mentioned before, paleontologists have only uncovered just one Amargosaurus fossil but paleontologists were able to recover enough of its bones to give us a good picture of this dinosaur's appearance and habits. The fossil includes parts from the back of the skull to the base of the tail, and some of the bones were found still connected. This fossil also includes part of the Amargosaurus skull, a rare finding since the skulls of seropods are easily detached from the rest of their skeletons after death. After studying this skull, scientists were able to decipher that the Amargosaurus did not have a good sense of hearing. Then they moved on to studying the most unique area of the Amargosaurus, its double row of spines that it had on its back. Initially, paleontologists theorized that there were air sacs between the spines, helping oxygen travel more easily throughout their larger bodies. A more agreed upon theory at the time was that the double row of long spines sticking out from its shoulders and back were connected by skin like a sail. This sail might have been used for display, defense, or for regulating its temperature. Paleontologist Gregory Poe in 1994 considered this possibility unlikely, noting that the neck sail would have deduced the Amargosaurus's neck flexion. Instead, he found that the shape indicates that the spine supported a keratinous sheath that would have extended the length of the spines in life. When the animal bent its neck downwards, they would have stuck out like a pincushion. 
They might have probably lacked the strength to fend off large predators, but they might have scared or hurt them away. Another unique fact that paleontologists later discovered is that a margosaurus was actually a pretty fast theropod, as fast as a modern day rhinoceros. These paleontologists have hypothesized that a margosaurus would have actually run quickly for a theropod. A margosaurus was a quadruped and probably was unable to rear on its hind legs. Salgado and Bonaparte in 1991 suggested that a margosaurus was a slow walker, like most theropods, and because both its forearms and lower legs were proportionally short a feature common to slow-moving animals. This was contradicted by Gerardo Maceta and Richard Farina in 1999, who argued that a margosaurus was capable of rapid locomotion. During locomotion, leg bones are strongly affected by bending moments, representing a limiting factor for the maximum speed of an animal. The leg bones of a margosaurus were even more sturdy than those of today's white rhinoceros, which is adapted to galloping. The evidence suggests that it reached speeds up to 31 miles per hour, just one mile short of Tyrannosaurus, which was clocked at 32 miles an hour. So just imagine the Jeep chase scene and replace the T-Rex with a Margosaurus. That's probably how fast it could run, or gallop. Now that we have some background knowledge of a Margosaurus, let's talk about the environment which it lived in to give us a better idea of how to accurately design an enclosure better suited for a Margosaurus. A Margosaurus was of course discovered in the Amarga Foundation in present day Argentina, and paleontologists have so far discovered that this specific ecosystem contained various floodplains and lakes. Like many seropods, it must have eaten large amounts of plant material each day to sustain itself, which meant that this dinosaur thrived in a number of different ecosystems. But since it was smaller comparatively to other seropods it coexisted with, it became perfectly suited for low lying plants, which had less competition. Paleontologists believed that the rest of the Amargosaurus habitat consisted of the dry woodlands that made up much of South America at the time. The dinosaur would have spent the majority of its time looking for its main food, which like most theropods were probably conifers. It swallowed leaves whole without chewing them, and may have had grassroots in its stomach to help digest this tough plant material. Initially, it had blunt teeth, useful for stripping foliage. The foliage that made up its varied diet may have included plant species such as ginkgos, seed ferns, cycads, club mosses, and horsetails. So now that we know a little bit more about a Margosaurus, let's go ahead and start uh, doing its enclosure. Um, based on the info we got, let's go ahead and do a lake uh, with a theme of having some uh, woodlands, um, dry woodlands. So we're gonna go ahead and make this grass a bit, uh, a bit more gritty, if you will. So right now I'm just making the small little crevices to make the, ourselves a lake. Try not to make a circle. Well, at least I don't try to make a circle, so it looks a bit more natural. Just do that, and now you have your embankments. But in order to make it a bit more, uh, I guess, better suited for your dinosaurs, so they don't uh, look kind of wonky during the during the game we're gonna go ahead and flatten them but we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of uh when the animals are nervous so mm -hmm. am i make the lake a bit bigger the territory and i shouldn't have to remind you that ours is and now like dinosaurs. i mentioned i'm gonna go ahead and mess with the terrain I'm gonna smooth it out and just go ahead and smooth out all the edges around the lake that'll give it a nice uh even look so it won't look like a drop off and uh, it'll just make the dinosaurs move around a bit better. If you have really steep hills, uh, the dinosaurs kinda, kinda tend to move around a little bit weird. So yeah, just go this way. And also gives it a more natural appearance. So yeah, just go ahead and do it all around of the, the lake. And as you can see, you got a little bit of that going, which is pretty cool, how it would look in the, in the lakes. And I think after this, I think we're good with the lake now. Now let's go ahead and put some rocks. And I mean, for this, uh, you can go ahead and place them wherever you want based on, you know, what you think looks better or not. I like to use the rule of um, bunching them together, especially in areas of lakes, um, bodies of water, I mean, but in this instance, a lake. And uh, just place them close, close together in groups um throughout the lake and then eventually throughout the rest of the enclosure 
But um, this is uh, pretty much up to you. You can go ahead and use whichever rock you want. I'm gonna go with uh, with two of them, the temperate rocks, which are gonna be in the lake, and then these desert rocks over here um, towards where we're gonna put the woodlands. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and use these small ones. If you use big, big rocks too many times, it'll start giving it a natural look. But yeah, I just place them all around the enclosure. Just a uh, cool little thing I do here is uh, I just put the rock under one of the pillars. It takes it away and it gives it a bit better of a wider opening. Since we're going to have some sauropods in here, I thought I'd make uh, some of the pillars disappear. And like I said, so this dry woodland, we're going to use this... Uh, type of grass that looks um you know not fully flush but you know it's got some dirt and some fallen leaves in there to you know represent that the environment is uh i guess not that lush <laughs> that it's uh that it gets dry sometimes so uh just place that all throughout the habitat and i mean this habitat's uh much bigger than many habitats and habitat that you'll probably build so yeah just adjust accordingly make the lake a bit smaller and uh and try to just uh make everything a good uh ratio if you will so right now we're gonna go ahead and put some uh some rock and some sand all throughout the embankments um and that way you can start blending in the the landscape so it doesn't look like it's just one. Yeah, you guys let me know what you guys think. If you guys would change something or if you guys have different techniques, just go ahead and write in the comments. I'm always opening to, uh, open, sorry, <laughs> to uh, new suggestions. Um, one suggestion I got from uh, a YouTuber here is uh, putting rock all over your lake. That'll give the lake a bit more... Uh, more depth to it, so it'll look darker, so it'll look like it's deeper. Um, and just, uh, you know, put some grass here and there. Not fully. You know, you kind of just want to blend it in. Don't have it just look like it's just one full <laughs> floor of, uh, of a certain type of topography or landscape. And now we're going to go ahead and use uh, the very first forest. Um, since it's woodland, we're going to use a lot of uh, oaks and uh, uh, conifers and uh, fir trees. So we're going to use a lot of these. Um, and we're going to use this fibrous ground cover um, as, the, as the ferns, as a primary food source for the primary source. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, place some of that. Um, since it's dry woodlands, we don't want to build too much, but um, let's go ahead and now do our uh, our ferns, which are going to be our Temskia. These are our ferns, and we're going to do a little uh, a little layer right through this uh, between this lake and the woodlands, sort of like a transition from you know um, from woody trees to more. Uh, to more uh, foliage than needs water. So now we're gonna go ahead and write our, put our cycads near the water. And these, like I said, you can go um, whichever way you want, but cycads, for the most part, part, tend to be near the bodies of water. Same with the jinkos. Um, try to place them near the water and throughout the habitat. This is all up to you, really. Let's just try to have a nice, um, Nice amount of uh, of trees going everywhere, and then finally we're gonna use some seed plants. Those are gonna be our uh, our seed ferns. The fibrous ground cover could be our cloud mosses and uh, the jinkos. I mean that's self-explanatory. Stuff with the cycads and the conifers being our forest. So we're just gonna go ahead and uh, fill up the rest. Since there's going to be plenty of sauropods in this game, in this enclosure, I mean, 
um, try to put as much uh, foliage as you as you can. As you know, the seropods in this game really, really like the foliage. So go ahead and go a little bit crazy on it. Just make sure you uh, you have a good amount of combination between the two, and that your seed plants and your side cats are near the bodies of water, while your um, big conifers and woodland-like trees are more on the outside of the lake. So here it is, guys. What do you guys think? As I mentioned, go ahead and comment and let me know what you guys would do different or what you like. Also, if you want to make a Margasaurus few more at home, you can add some dinosaurs that it coexists with. There will be some substitutes though, as the dinosaurs they coexisted with do not appear on Jurassic World Evolution 2. The Amargosaurus share this environment with other large seropods. These large seropods like the Zapellosaurus, Portosaurus, and Amarga Titanus grazed on the tall plants, while Amargosaurus grazed on the low foliage floor. The advantage of eating in different heights meant that they would not be competing for the same resources, which made them more compatible. As a substitute, I added a pair of dreadnoughts to the Amargosaurus enclosure. Compared to other Titanosaurus seropods in the game, the Dreadnoughts live in the same region as Amargosaurus, albeit in a different era. The Amargategos, a kind of Stegosaurus who paleontologists don't know much of, also lived alongside Amargosaurus and might have competed with it for food. I substituted the Amargategos with the Stegosaurus, as it lived in the same western hemisphere, unlike the other Stegosaurus in Jurassic World Evolution 2. As for those dinosaurs that might make a meal out of Amargosaurus, paleontologists know of only one a small theropod dinosaur called Liga Bueno. For this, I substituted Liga Bueno by replacing with the Colophysis or Trodon, as they're roughly of equal size. But that's if you're feeling daring. You can get away with it by not adding too many of these small theropods, but as I say, do so at your own risk. As I said, not much information is known about Margosaurus, but hopefully more excavation of the site will uncover more dinosaurs that live with the Margosaurus. As mentioned before, the same site that uncovered the Margosaurus discovered the Carnotaurus, but since they lived 50 million years away apart from each other, it would not be fair to include them in the same habitat. Apart from that, the Carnotaurus will get hungry and at one point will end up hurting your herbivores. You might have to play around with your dinosaur synthesizing and sandbox options to help with the dinosaur's incompatibility that one will get when mixing one or more syrup pots in the enclosure. The Amargosaurus has yet to make a big screen debut in any Jurassic Park movie, franchise, but has certainly not been overlooked. In Jurassic World, an Amargosinosaurus was one of the hybrids seen on the screen in the Hammond Creation Lab, alongside Stegoceratops in an unidentified Pachycephalosaurus hybrid. It is unknown if this hybrid was ever created, but this hybrid seems to have an Amargosaurus-like spine on its neck, which might indicate that it has DNA from the Amargosaurus. Only the front half of this hybrid is shown though, as the rest of it is obstructed by a transition to the Indominus Rex. It also shares a similarity with the hybrid Elidominus. This dinosaur also appears in Jurassic World Alive the video game, which I will talk about in a bit. Coincidentally, the Elidominus is a hybrid of a Therosinosaurus and the Indominus Rex, which could be a possible reference to the transition I mentioned. The Amargosaurus has made numerous appearances in Jurassic Park video games throughout the years. Amargosaurus made its first appearance in Jurassic Park Builder, where it only one sale. In Jurassic World, the game, and Jurassic World Alive, the Amargosaurus was updated, where it had more accurate design. Its design was further perfected and stylized in Jurassic World Evolution 2. While not in the Jurassic Park universe, Amargosaurus was rumored to make an appearance on the big screen with Disney's 2000 live-action computer-animated film Dinosaur, but its plans were soon abandoned. Nevertheless, this small, unorthodox, but dangerous seropod is a beautiful, but deadly addition to your Jurassic Park. Thank you all for watching, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more. See you in the next one.